right. Nathan Hager, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Madison Mills, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Let's turn our attention to markets here. I don't know, heck of a first half of the year. If you just look at the in indexes, the S&P, yeah. then NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100. I mean, if you happen to own that Magnificent 7, you're just ripping it here. But how about for the rest of us? And what do we do for the back half of the year? Let's bring in somebody who does his stuff for a living. We like to say David Bonson. He's the CIO of the Bonson Group. Joining us uh, here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, which means he's live on YouTube as well. Because, you know, we... We YouTube stream this thing oh, on, yeah. on cross YouTube. Platform. You can go to, yeah, cross platform. Thank you. That's a good, like, multimedia <laughs> thing. Yeah, you just have to go to YouTube and search Bloomberg Global News and you'll, and you'll get that stream. Uh, David, thanks so much for joining us here. Um, again, kind of a market year to date that hasn't, the, the indexes look good, the numbers kind of look good, but if you didn't own a handful of stocks, you're, you're lagging here. How do you think about the first half and, and kind of how the market performed? And what do you think about for the second half of the year? Yeah, there's only two precedents where I've seen it where the cap weighted index was so good from such a few amount of companies and that was in 1999 and that period in 2020 and it never ever ever ends well. Uh, you look at the equal weighted S&P on yep. the year, it's a totally different story. Now people can say, I don't care, I don't own the equal weighted S&P. So as long, if it's six companies carrying the index and I own the index, I'm fine. But the problem with that, of course, is it's unsustainable. Markets are mean, reverting things. This will revert to the mean. You will need more participation to see a broader market movement. So what about what you're looking at next? Uh, I'm stealing this from Abigail Doolittle, Doolittle from earlier in the show. She was saying that markets are gonna be moving more on earnings than Fed moves in the next couple of months. Do you agree? I think markets always move off of earnings other than sometimes in a couple of months or weeks or days. Ultimately, this is a Ben Graham 101, markets move by earnings. And I think that you will get better cash flow growth outside of AI and big tech. And that the idea of people anticipating the Fed or trying to gain what the Fed will do, the Fed's role in market movements is way too high. And it's only a matter of when, not if, that reverts to more normal weighing of market movement. Looking at some of your stock picks here, I see some financial services. So let's start off just kind of how you're viewing financial services. I guess that mini little crisis we had in some of the regional banks, that didn't scare you away from the sector? Well, we only like a couple names, and okay. Truist is the big regional we own, but it wasn't because we weren't afraid of what happened. It's because we didn't think what happened affected Truist. And now, Truist is the old, remember? bb and t and SunTrust. And SunTrust, They okay. merged together, and that's a super regional by any definition of the word. It's only a little smaller than some of those kind of yep. cities in Bank of Americas, and it's a lot bigger than the Silicon Valleys and First Republic. So it's kind of in this no man's land, but it was being treated as a regional. It's interesting. Remember when they put the deposit together to help out First Republic? Yep. Truist was one of the banks that did that. They put a billion dollars into that. They weren't in need of deposit money. They were giving deposit money. Mm -hmm. So we think Truist was misunderstood and the market has great cash flows to get through this tough period. So I noticed in your stock picks, none of them are super AI related at all. Um, what do you say to clients then who are calling in and saying, why are we not getting in on the AI rally? So I believe that the way we're invested in AI is the only way people should be invested in it. And that's with companies that actually already have incumbent businesses that make a ton of money. Mm. Broadcom, Cisco, and IBM, we own all three. Broadcom's the most AI adjacent, but it's not relying on AI. Like if something were to happen that moves with AI, the whole sentiment changed. NVIDIA could drop 50% in one a day. Mm -hmm. Broadcom is far less reliant on that and yet really does have fundamental exposure. So we like the idea of hedging with cash flow, with a mm -hmm. balance sheet, with a real business. And there is an AI component in old line businesses like IBM and Cisco. It's not the most leverage. It's obviously not the most beta, but we think it's a safer way to still be exposed to AI. So we are coming up on earnings in a couple of weeks. We've got the big banks kicking us off here. I'm looking at the S&P 500, the bottoms up numbers like 220 bucks per share EPS. I've heard people, I guess not recently, but they were talking about this thing could be 200 bucks, oh. something like that. I mean, do you still see some meaningful earnings risk in this market? 
I believe that if you're going to have a severe recession, it's inevitable. In fact, it's sort of a tautology. There is no recession if earnings stay at 220. Yep. Like by definition, a recession means corporate profits drop. And at 200, that would be about a reasonable expectation. I think the market priced a lot of that expectation in last year. Right. Remember, right. we were at one point looking forward at what, 250 or so. And so I don't think that it is the most likely scenario to happen. I think there's been a lot of earnings resilience. Uh, but it, the problem is the way the market's set up now, it's really dependent on one or two sectors. And you could have earnings in aggregate that hold in there, but the uh, impact sector by sector is very different. What needs to happen to change that, to, to change that dynamic of just the narrow rally that we've seen in the S&P? Yeah, it, it, it's inevitable it happen, but it's going to be when the Fed is not our number one story, when everyone yeah. isn't just sitting around uh, waiting on the words of a press conference with Jay Powell. That'll ultimately be what changes it. And, you know, I don't think it's good for index investors if we go into the next phase 19 or 20 times forward earnings. Mm -hmm. You'd rather be at 16 or 17 forward, and even that's not cheap. Yeah. But to go into the next phase already above average valuation, I think will be a, a difficult place to start at. Uh, we just prefer to be much more selective and we run a really concentrated portfolio. Mm -hmm. Are you, so concentrated portfolio, define what that means for you guys. We have right now 33 stocks. I've never had less than 25. I've never had more than 35, but that's mm -hmm. not by design. If we had 50 companies that met our criteria, we may own 50, but it's always right around 30. How much cash do you have? Right now we have about 3%. We don't usually like to run more. Clients pay us to get them risk premia, but we have cash right now just from a sale position that we haven't replaced. And how many, how many tech names would you say are in there right now? See, I roughly? don't think that the cool kids would consider these tech names, but, <laughs> but Cisco, Broadcom, IBM, those, those are, the those are tech that, names. Okay. But if it's not a dividend growing cash flow generative name, which takes out Fang, yeah. it takes out NVIDIA, AI, the big six, seven, even Microsoft, they just quit growing the dividend relative to the valuation they had. So we sold that years ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so whether it's new tech or even some of those old tech names, uh, Apple and Microsoft both should be two of the the biggest dividend growing names in history. That's what I've been saying. I mean, like Apple, and I say this to all the tech investors and they push back on me, but I mean, it, they have a yield less than 1% in dividend yield. You know, they got a gajillion dollars worth of cash, so 90 to $100 billion of free cash flow. Yes, I know they buy back stock, but a lot of that's just to cover the options that, that, that you're issuing. Why do you think they don't have a three, three and a half percent dividend yield? Oh, I think it is purely an ego issue in Silicon Valley where they believe, like the reason people push back with you is tech investors believe that they can invest the money better than we can. And they can to a point, but there's a diminishing return. Yep. That's why dividend growth is so important for shareholders. At some point, the C-suite starts doing dumb things. Now, Apple makes so much money, they got yep. away with it. Mm. My example years ago is they bought Dr. Dre's headphone company for yeah. $3 yeah. billion. Dollars. It wasn't worth $800 million soaking wet. <laughs> now, for a normal company to throw two, two and a half billion in the trash can, that'd be a problem. For Apple, it didn't matter. But that's the kind of bad deals companies do when they're not returning cash. So give me a name in your portfolio that is a good dividend growth mm. story that you guys own. For well, all 33 names in our okay. portfolio are good dividend growing names. But you look at the consumer staples, your Johnson Johnson's, Procter Gamble's, Pepsi's, Clorox, they could bore people to death. They've had the best pricing power of any sector through this mm. period of time. Their uh, top line sales have either come down or stayed flat, and yet profits are up anywhere from 7 to 15%. Mm. You have a lot of dividend growth embedded in that sector and then energy the midstream pipelines are growing dividends double digits and they're less levered now than they were when they started mm -hmm. so we really like that midstream energy for dividend growth any Do discretionary names in our final couple of seconds together see this is a funny thing is i've only owned what i consider one consumer discretionary name my whole career and it's mcdonald's but i'm not sure i'm not sure <laughs> it's, it's a really staple, a consumer no? discretion right? i think right? it's a staple i think you have to own those uh, you have to buy those be. french fries and it's really a real estate company at the end of the day oh, yeah interesting. exactly and i learned that from watching the movie Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I learned. I didn't know yeah. that. It made a, t a ton of sense. You're yeah. not in the hamburger business. You're in the real estate yeah. business. Right. So, there you go. All right, David, thanks so much for joining us. David Bonson, he's the CIO of the Bonson Group. I like the strategy of, you know, consolidated portfolio yeah. uh, and looking at dividends. I mean, that's something you can get your head around. Yeah. Um, where that takes you, I don't know, but it takes you to some of those big staples as well. Well, and it's just so interesting. You talk about this all the time, Paul. What are we doing with these dividends at these big tech companies? Yep. They just, they don't want to do it. Yeah, they push back, they yeah. push back. Uh, but I, my pushback on Apple is it's not a technology company, it's a consumer products company. Mm. 
Mm. That's my pushback. That's so we'll interesting. See That's a hot that take. is interesting. That's a hot take. <laughs> S&P absolutely unched on the day. That unched term is for Lisa Brahma. She hates it. So I always bring it up when I can. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. We'll get world and national news for Amy Morrison.